From failure to success. Everyday habits and exercises to build mental resilience and turn failures into successes. By Martin Meadows. Prologue. I spent weeks working with my designer to develop a video course about self-discipline. I thought that people would enjoy watching fun, animated graphics to learn about self-discipline, and it would become one of my most successful products. I published the course on the biggest platform for video courses, distributed free coupon codes to hundreds of people, and waited for an endless rain of money. But it didn't happen. I made a whopping $23.63 in the first month and $51.40 in the second month. Earnings picked up somewhat over the next few months, but considering I had invested a few thousand dollars in my product, I was still well in the red. Most people enjoyed my course, but you can't pay bills with positive feedback. I decided to invest in a new, shorter course and make numerous improvements. The final product was immensely better than the first course. I also spent almost $1,000 less, so I was sure I would recoup my investment quickly. Except I didn't. The course completely failed, making a grand total of $368.08 in the first six months of its existence. I couldn't give up. I knew that I could make this idea work. After all, I was making some money, just not enough to recoup my investment. I invested about $5,000 in my third course. I provided even more practical and actionable content, and my designer created beautiful new illustrations and engaging animations. Surely I succeeded this time, right? Not really. I made $250 in the first month, and over the subsequent months, earnings took a dive. I lost almost everything I invested in this course. As a last attempt, I decided to create a short video course that I would offer completely for free. I thought that if people enjoyed my free course, they would purchase other courses. No dice. I invested over $2,000 and only recouped $65.21 in YouTube advertising revenue. Even worse, the free course didn't translate into more sales of the paid courses. I would love to tell you that the story had a happy ending, but it didn't. Thirteen months have passed since I released my first course, and I'm still almost $10,000 in the red. Even though I'm a best-selling author with thousands of loyal readers, I still failed, big time. I'm telling you this because I want to show you that nobody is immune to failure. I'm just like you. What qualifies me to write a book about struggle are all of the failures I've experienced to this day and the tools I've developed to handle them. Before, I would torture myself for days, getting angry at everyone and everything, thinking how unfair it was for me to fail. Now, to me failure is pretty much like water off a duck's back. To some people failure is the worst thing in the world, while to others it's exciting and even inspiring. One person doesn't stop even for a second when they face obstacles or make mistakes, while another person immediately gives up. Convinced that success is black or white, you either reach your goal or you don't. What makes the difference between those people? How can you use failure to propel you to become a better person? What if there were a simple tweak that would help you redefine what failure means to you? Lastly, how can you stop getting so angry and discouraged at failure, accept it with dignity and proclaim, on to the next one? This book will answer all of these questions with plenty of real-world examples from the realms of personal development, health, fitness, business, relationships, and numerous other domains where failure is a constant companion. What's important isn't reaching the goal by a given deadline. It's reaching the goal, period. Empowering Story Number 2, Peter Diamandis Upon discovering that Charles Lindbergh flew from New York to Paris in 1927 to win a $25,000 prize, engineer, physician, and entrepreneur Peter Diamandis came up with an idea to offer an incentive prize to build and fly a reusable private spaceship. In May 1996, without the prize money in hand, Peter went on stage under the St. Louis Gateway Arch and announced the $10 million prize to build and fly a reusable private spaceship carrying three people into space on two flights within two weeks. He thought that he would easily find a sponsor. 
Moreover, the prize was to be paid after the spaceship successfully completed both flights, and you don't exactly build a spaceship in a few weeks, so there was plenty of time to find the right benefactor. Except it didn't work out as Peter expected. Between 1996 and 2001 he would pitch to over 150 sponsors, and get rejected 150 times. Fortunately, his persistence and grit eventually paid off when in 2002 six years after announcing the prize he met the Ansari family who ultimately funded the $10 million prize. The prize was paid out on October 4, 2004 to the Spaceship One team led by American designer Bert Rutten. Today, the Sprize Foundation has awarded over $300 million in Sprizes designed to encourage technological development and radical breakthroughs for the benefit of humanity. Chapter 4, Dealing with a Failure Due to a Lack of Focus In today's world of never-ending busyness and hundreds of tasks to do, Failure due to a lack of focus is one of the most common reasons why people can't achieve their goals. In fact, I believe this problem is the biggest hurdle for accomplishment, and that's why I wrote an entire book about it, The Ultimate Focus Strategy. How to set the right goals, develop powerful focus, stick to the process, and achieve success. The fundamental rule of the ultimate focus strategy is that the more goals you have, the less likely you are to achieve them. I strongly recommend limiting your objectives to no more than three, and ideally just one or two, that you'll be working on every day, or as often as you can. Working on numerous goals in different walks of life at once means inevitably neglecting some of them. At one point, I practiced five different sports bodybuilding, rock climbing, Krav Mega, tennis, and swimming. I also took frequent walks, and went on bike rides. Needless to say, I couldn't really focus properly on any of those activities and progress quickly. I had to quit bodybuilding, tennis, and swimming sports that I had been failing at anyway, and didn't enjoy as much so I could improve quickly in rock climbing and Krav Mega sports that I find more entertaining and challenging. If it hadn't been for quitting those sports, I know I would have continued to fail. My performance would have been heavily affected by a lack of focus. In my book, I cover in great detail how to focus on the right goals in the long term, but for a quick summary, here are the basic guidelines that will help you eliminate the risk of failing due to spreading yourself too thin. 1. Sacrifice is necessary. Sacrificing less important goals will give you more power to work on the most crucial objectives. Prioritize big life improvements like changing your diet, getting a better job, starting a business, or finding a life partner over less significant objectives. 2. Embrace boredom. It's exciting to set new goals or follow new strategies, but if you prioritize excitement over effectiveness, you'll only lose focus and possibly fail. If something works, stick to it. 3. Pare it down. Each time you're struggling with prioritizing your tasks, consider which task can make other tasks irrelevant or easier, and do that one first. Resist the temptation to procrastinate by first doing the easiest tasks on your to-do list. Instead, find a way to perform a task that will permanently take those less important tasks off your list. One of the world's most successful venture capitalists, Chris Saka, founder of Lowercase Capital and a guest shark on ABC's reality television show Shark Tank, wrote in his blog post announcing his goodbye to the venture capital world the following paragraph. The only way I know to be awesome at startups is to be obsessively focused and pegged to the floor of the deep end, gasping for air. I succeeded at venture capital because, for years, I rarely thought about or spent time on anything else. Anything less than that unmitigated full commitment leaves me feeling frustrated and ineffective. As you've heard me say on the show, if I'm not all in, I'm out. If you're working on a particularly challenging goal, the all-in or out approach might be the only way forward, and it certainly won't hurt if you decide to follow this philosophy at least partly and greatly limit your focus. Exercise number 5. Focus to the extreme. It's incredible how much you can achieve if you focus on one key goal and disregard everything else. While most people will find it impossible to have a single focus in life there are always many obligations to attend to. 
Try to set aside a weekend or perhaps even an entire week, during which you'll only work on one key goal. Successful entrepreneur Craig Ballantyne suggests in his article, you have never thought this way before that if you want to finish your product and start a business, book a hotel conference room if you must. Pay the money up front so you won't back out. Arrive there early and lock yourself in and don't come out until you have a product too. Your worst case scenario would affect your life negatively. I'm not downplaying how unpleasant it would feel, but most likely, it would be a short-term situation that you could remedy relatively quickly, as long as you would care about changing it. Again, I'm not downplaying how difficult life is for the homeless or the poor. Turning your life around can take years, and in some places, or in some circumstances it's more challenging than in others. However, there are still plenty of examples of people rising out of poverty or homelessness. Even the worst circumstances can be temporary, as long as you maintain a tight grip on what you can control your thoughts and actions. 3. Everything is temporary Stoics understood that everything in life is temporary. You can be in a relationship today and be single tomorrow. You can drive an expensive car and live in a mansion today and rent a small room and use your feet as a means of transport a year from now. You can be perfectly healthy now and bedridden next week. My friend has a stable, enviable job in a multinational S&P 500 corporation with a long history and great prospects for the future. As the only expert in his domain in his area, his position is as secure as it could be. Yet, he still periodically browses through job offers and keeps in touch with headhunters. You could say that since his position is so secure, there's no way he could ever lose his job. But as a shrewd person, he recognizes that everything is temporary. Even if the worst happens and he gets fired due to the factors outside his control, he'll be prepared thanks to his policy of keeping eyes open for new opportunities. Exercise number 3, A Disturbing Goodbye. A powerful, but let's admit it disturbing exercise you can perform to improve the key relationships in your life is to imagine it's the last time you're seeing the other person. As morbid as it sounds, sometimes I remind myself that every important person in my life can disappear from it literally overnight. Being in the wrong place at the wrong time is all it takes to lose a life. Would I really want our last interaction to be negative? Would I really get angry over a little insignificant thing? Would I really want to waste time arguing instead of enjoying each other's company? This practice will help you stop taking people for granted, and that will help your relationships flourish because whenever you'll slip back into negative communication habits, imagining it's the last time you're seeing another person will shake you back into the realization that things are temporary and remind you how fragile life is. It all sounds dire and grim to think about negative events, but it doesn't mean that if you want to follow stoicism, you need to be fatalistic or pessimistic. It's not about living your life as if it were a life sentence of suffering. Rather, it's about accepting the world how it is, so you can maintain good spirits even when things aren't going well. In essence, stoicism is about maximizing your happiness, no matter what the circumstances may be. When you land in trouble or suffer a terrible blow, espousing the belief that everything is temporary will help you handle it more quickly. After all, as the old adage says, this too shall pass. You might be in debt today, but if you work on eliminating it, eventually you'll be free of it. It's not a permanent condition that's beyond your control. Likewise, a success can be also short-lived, so when you live according to this philosophy, you'll be more watchful to keep the good things in your life instead of resting on your laurels. Exercise number 4. What do you take for granted? It's easy to believe that the things you have in your life will be there forever. This erroneous belief can make you complacent and consequently increase the risk of losing those things. Spend a few minutes making a list of things you take for granted. For example, you could write point one dot my partner point two dot my business point three dot my health point four dot hot running water point five dot electricity point six dot a comfortable bed to sleep on point seven dot a smartphone. Now, focus on the relationships and achievements on your list. Ask yourself if you're indeed paying enough attention to them. Taking those things for granted can make you stop putting enough effort to maintain them. 
This can increase the risk of losing those things, and when it does happen, it produces a shock that often feels like it couldn't have been prevented. After all, you thought it was yours forever, so how in the world could you have ever predicted you would lose it? Take action today, even if it feels like everything is perfect. Make an extraordinary effort to not merely maintain them, but also to take the relationships and achievements in your life to the next level. Surprise your partner by planning a romantic weekend getaway to a cabin in the mountains. Resist being complacent in your business by taking a big risk to expand it to another market or by making some improvements in your daily processes. Even if you feel perfectly healthy, do blood work to make sure everything is fine. And even if it is, make an effort to further improve your diet and fitness levels. Dealing with a failure you couldn't prevent, quick recap 1. The first common type of failure is failure that you can't prevent. In contrast to other failures, as the name implies, you usually can't prevent it. Fortunately, there's a lot you can do to handle it better. The most powerful approach is adopting the philosophy of stoicism and the stance that if something is beyond your control, you need to accept it and move on. Point two. Practice acceptance by deliberately introducing uncomfortable changes, not resisting your emotions. Venting or denial only makes things worse, and reminding yourself that some things are not up to you, and it should actually become a source of comfort for you because the matter is settled and you're free to move on. Point 3. Practicing misfortune by envisioning negative events or creating uncomfortable circumstances is a good way to increase the control you have over your own emotions because ultimately, it's one of the few things you do control. Point 4. Lastly, remember that everything is temporary. Embracing this philosophy can help you in two ways. You'll stop taking things for granted and put in more effort to maintain them, and you'll get better at handling blows. After all, Chapter 3, Dealing with a Failure Due to Unrealistic Expectations Professor and psychologist Janet Polivy posits that people don't behave logically when time and time again they try to introduce a change in their lives despite previous failures. According to her concept of the false hope syndrome, many individuals are stuck in a cycle in which they have unrealistic expectations about accomplishing their goals. They tend to be wrong about the speed, amount, ease and consequences of their attempts. 16. They try, fail, brood over it, process it and try again, but with the same unrealistic expectations, which guarantees yet another failure. Bob wants to lose 50 pounds as quickly as possible. He sets a goal to burn excess fat within three months. This new diet he just read about looks easy, and after all, what's so difficult about losing weight? When he steps on the scales two weeks later, he realizes he's only lost four pounds. There's also little difference in his appearance. Frustrated at the slow pace and his restrictive crash diet, he gorges on fast food for the entire week. A month passes. Bob realizes he really needs to lose weight. He'll reach it this time, he assures himself. He just didn't try hard enough with his previous attempt. If you've ever cheated on a diet, you probably experienced the screw it. I messed up thoughts. The slip up might not have been a big issue in itself. But succumbing to these thoughts and consequently going on a full-blown cheat week ruined your prior progress. If instead you had reassured yourself it was just a small slip-up, that positive attitude would help you avoid further, more lasting negative consequences. Neurologist Judy Willis notes in her article on rewiring a burned-out brain that the brain literally rewires to be more efficient in conducting information through the circuits that are most frequently activated. As you internalize your thwarted efforts to achieve your goals and interpret them as personal failure, your self-doubt and stress activate and strengthen your brain's involuntary, reactive neural networks. As these circuits become the automatic go-to networks, the brain is less successful in problem-solving and emotional control. When problems arise that previously would have been evaluated by the higher brain's reasoning, the dominant networks and the lower brain usurp control. 13. In other words, dwelling on your failure reinforces it and makes you less effective at dealing with future failures. 
Turning the failure into a lesson, remember our definition of failure, will help you to reinforce a positive coping mechanism. I'd been trying to get down to a single digit body fat percentage for years. Each time I commenced a new workout and nutrition plan, I failed within several weeks or months upon realizing that not much had changed in my physique. To say it was frustrating would be an understatement. After several failed attempts, I came up with a genius idea that maybe, just maybe it would be a good idea to learn my lessons and try a completely different approach. I know, sometimes I'm not a particularly bright guy. Upon investigating the reasons behind my past failures, I realized that I'd been making three cardinal mistakes. One, I exercised at the gym despite not really enjoying it, hence my workouts weren't as effective as they could be. Two, I craved two quick results, which made my nutrition plan unsustainable. And three, my motivation was too weak enjoying a great physique wasn't a good enough reason to persist when I felt frustrated. I hated the lessons my failures taught me by replacing boring, frustrating bodybuilding exercises with fun, passion-filled rock climbing and Krav Mega, an Israeli self-defense system workouts. I refined my diet to deliver slow, but sustainable results that aren't spectacular on a week-to-week -week basis, but lead to extraordinary results on a month-to-month -month basis. Lastly, I uncovered a stronger reason why I wanted to accomplish my goal. Dropping body fat tremendously improved my climbing performance. I linked my weight loss to one of the biggest passions in my life, and suddenly everything was easier to handle. In the end, the lessons I learned from past failures delivered a big impact on my general well-being and helped me get closer to reaching my goal. Exercise number one, learn from failure. The next time you fail, resist the temptation to let anger, frustration, discouragement or self-guilt make you give up. Give yourself time to process the negative emotions, and then make a list of the lessons you've learned from not reaching your desired outcome. This will help you develop a positive mechanism for coping with failure. When you transform a failure into a list of lessons, you empower yourself by thinking in terms of possible ideas for improvement instead of poisoning yourself with negativity. Three metaphors you can use to change your definition of failure. You already know that words are powerful. I hope that now you will consider failure a valuable tool, and not a useless, frustrating and discouraging event. You can further reframe how you think about failure by using metaphors. A word or a phrase that represents one thing while talking about another is a sneaky way to unconsciously change how you think about something. Thinking of a certain problem as a crushing burden makes you associate it with an ordeal. You feel like you're too weak to get it off your shoulders and breathe freely again. How are you supposed to overcome it when merely thinking about it makes you physically shrink? Replacing this metaphor with something more empowering for example, thinking of a problem like a barbell that you want to lift off the ground to build muscle and get stronger will shift your attitude to a more positive one. Here are three metaphors you can use to further drive the point home that failure is necessary and useful. 1. Failure is like navigating a maze. If you imagine the process of working on your goal as navigating a maze, each failure teaches you what doesn't work. One by one, you're eliminating ineffective approaches. When you adopt this metaphor, failure won't mean the end. It will mean a new beginning. It's close to impossible to escape a maze without getting yourself into a dead end or two. Isn't it interesting that some people will pay to enter a cornfield maze and have the time of their lives trying to get out, but give up immediately when they get lost in the exact same albeit metaphorical maze when working on their goals? 2. Failure is like a sculpting tool. Michelangelo once said that every block of stone has a statue inside it, and it is the task of the sculptor to discover it. 14. When you adapt this metaphor, each failure will fuel your curiosity to discover the statue inside the stone you're carving. The process of carving this metaphorical stone doesn't merely shape the stone, it also shapes the sculptor. Each failure improves your carving skills, and as you are slowly discovering the sculpture inside the stone you're carving, you are also uncovering a better sculptor in yourself. 3. Failure is a filter. One of my favorite metaphors for failure is that it's a filter. The longer something takes and the more patience it requires, 
the more people it filters out along the way. Difficult goals are often easier to reach because there's less competition if patience plays a big role in their accomplishment. The fact that some things are hard filters out those who don't have enough resolve and rewards those who do, it also blesses the latter not only with success, but also immense personal growth and increased mental resilience. When looking at failure from this perspective, you should be grateful that your goal is so difficult to achieve because it ensures that you need to go through a long, hard process that will make you a better person. There are many stories of people who won the lottery only to lose it all, if not to end up worse off than they were before their lucky day. That's what happens when you score an easy when you didn't earn you get the event, success, but you don't get the process that shapes you to become a person who actually deserves it and knows how to handle it. Compare those lucky winners with people who spend long years toiling away at their businesses, dealing with one failure after another, and pushing through. When they finally build a successful business and start earning a lot of money, they'll be infinitely less likely to lose it all. Precisely because it wasn't easy to achieve, now they'll be able to enjoy their success for decades to come. Think of it as treating the symptoms versus eliminating the root cause. An easy win such as winning the lottery or undergoing a weight loss surgery. He picks a new popular diet this one will surely work. And starts again. Three weeks later, Bob is seen filling his shopping cart with so much junk food that he can barely push the cart to the counter. This process repeats over and over again. After each failure, Bob rejects the notion that his approach is flawed. He either didn't try hard enough, or it was the wrong diet. He never questions that maybe it's not about little adjustments, but that his entire approach needs to change to one of focusing on sustainable results and permanent changes. As Janet Polivy asks in her paper, do those who succeed on their sixth attempt succeed by using, once again, the same strategy that failed on the previous five attempts? Or do those who succeed on the sixth attempt do so because they have adjusted their strategy to make it more realistic and therefore more likely to succeed? If you repeatedly fail with the same goal, it's possible you set unrealistic expectations and are stuck in the false hope loop. Here are three principles. To avoid chasing impossible goals. 1. Do proper research. Ignorance is the culprit of the false hope syndrome. A person who wants to make a positive change in their life will exhibit overexcitement and a readiness to start as quickly as possible usually at the expense of doing proper research. Note that this usually happens to a person who doesn't know much about the goal they want to reach. Elon Musk can say that he'll send people to Mars within a decade because he's already an extremely accomplished entrepreneur and knows a lot about the space industry. Your neighbor Joe is an unlikely space pioneer unless he happens to be a billionaire astrophysicist. He would make a better start in the business world by building an e-commerce store or a landscaping company. To avoid failing due to unrealistic expectations, make sure to carefully research the feasibility of your goals. Can you really lose 10 pounds a week? Does an average entrepreneur build a six-figure business in six months? Has any world-class performer become one after a mere year of training? Explore different strategies to reach your goal, primarily focusing on the ones that have been proven to work for numerous people before. A revolutionary system to become a golf star within six weeks might sound exciting, but it's the plain old regular practice day in, day out for years. That delivers real-world, sustainable results. Side note, I cover in great detail how to do proper research and choose a winning strategy in my book The Ultimate Focus Strategy. How to set the right goals, develop powerful focus, stick to the process, and achieve success. 2. Be open to changing your approach. If you've already failed a couple of times and want to try again, consider completely changing your approach, rather than trying the same approach again and expecting different results. Perhaps the approach you've taken isn't founded on healthy principles or doesn't work in your unique situation. When you close your mind to alternative approaches, you can get stuck in the failure loop forever. It's like trying to dig a metro tunnel with a trowel. No matter how hard you work, you won't accomplish it in your lifetime. What you need is professional machinery, not more energy to dig with a trowel. 
I used to follow the traditional bodybuilding method of bulking up to gain muscle, and then going on a diet to shed excess body fat. I was so set on this strategy that I wouldn't even consider that there was another way to improve my physique even when the approach clearly didn't work for me, no matter how strict I was about it. Fortunately, multiple failures later I finally saw the light and decided to completely change my approach. I spent over five years launching one business after another. The process was virtually the same every time a new idea, a lot of enthusiasm, first steps, first problems, failure, depression, another new idea, another failure, rinse and repeat. Instead of picking one solid business idea and sticking to it no matter what, I gave myself failure after failure. Once again, if I hadn't opened my mind to a new approach, I wouldn't have reached my goal. If you've had similar experiences, drop all of your preconceived notions and try again with a completely different approach. Don't be afraid to experiment with a strategy that is opposite to what you've been sticking to until now. Being flexible is one of the most powerful traits for success. 1. Accept that things rarely go as planned. Peter Drucker once said that most people overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what they can do in 10 years. Before the construction of the countryside house for my parents commenced, I've previously mentioned that financing this project was one of my most important reasons to build a successful business. Everyone told me that in construction, everything takes twice as long and costs twice as much. I didn't believe it. After all, if you hire the right team and budget properly, it's impossible that such a thing can happen, right? How wrong I was. Everything did cost much more and did take much longer. It made me realize that even with the most careful calculations, you'll probably still overestimate how much you can achieve in a given period of time. If you refuse to accept this reality, say hello to the failure loop. When setting a new goal and deadline, remind yourself that ultimately even if you don't achieve something by your self-imposed deadline, you're still farther ahead. It's illogical to quit because during three months you've lost just 10 pounds instead of 20. Yet, that's precisely what many people do. They assume that since things didn't go exactly as planned, they failed. Then they get frustrated, turn to junk food to reassure themselves, and a few weeks later, the 10 pounds they've lost are back. To sum up, to avoid failure due to unrealistic expectations, focus on two key actions. 1. Ensure that your expectations are realistic by performing thorough research. Putting on rose-colored glasses and living in the world of happy ignorance is not a good way to reach your goals. There'll be time for moonshot goals once you become an expert and can accurately estimate the probability of reaching those big dreams. Develop patience and accept that even if you're the greatest project manager in the world, you'll still fail to account for every surprise, delay, and setback. As a guy obsessed with personal development, failure is an inherent part of my life. Over the years, I failed countless times in business. It took me several long years of struggle to launch my first profitable business. Most of the time, nobody but me believed that I would ever become a successful entrepreneur. And I don't blame them. I failed time after time, constantly riding a wild roller coaster of getting my hopes up, falling into depression then launching a new project that was followed by failure and another bout of depression. Health and fitness it took me years to change certain unhealthy habits and build a fit physique. For years, despite exercising religiously several times a week, if you looked at my body, you'd never think I went to the gym at all. In fact, pretty much every new gym goer had better results after a couple of months than I did after years of exercise, sacrifices, and countless hours spent researching how to turn my fitness around. Relationships for years, my extreme shyness prevented me from having a normal social life. Imagine a guy who radiates total awkwardness when merely talking to a woman about a neutral topic. Yeah, that was me. Sports and learning new skills I spent a year learning how to play tennis, only to realize that I was a hopeless case. I spent weeks learning Arabic only to discover that when I visited an Arabic-speaking country, almost nobody wanted to speak Arabic with me, let alone be impressed by my non-existent skills. I tried to learn how to invest in stock options only to realize that I couldn't even understand how fees were calculated. 
To say that I'm good buddies with failure would be an understatement. Fortunately, this also means I learned a lot about it. My intention for this book is to help you get more comfortable with struggles and failure and aid you in reaching your goals. Throughout the book I'll use the word failure or struggle to define any kind of a negative event that sets you back. Whenever I use these words, please think of them in a broad sense. The concepts don't apply only to failing your diet or an exam. We'll talk about dealing with adversity, handling a crisis, overcoming a failure due to personal deficiencies and bouncing back after making stupid mistakes, I'm a certified expert in this one. Each chapter comes with practical concepts and habits you can quickly introduce in your life. Throughout the book you'll also find exercise boxes that suggest additional actions you can take to improve your life and empowering stories, in which you'll learn about people who managed to achieve their goals despite constant struggles, rejection, crises, or failures. Finally, each chapter is summarized with a quick recap covering the most important points. Before we begin, I need to set the right expectations for you and address some important issues. Let's start with the big one. I am not a qualified therapist, and I am not some kind of a guru who knows everything there is to know about failure and success. I've simply had my share of those events and decided to share my experience in this book, along with many other tips I learned, thanks to scientific research and lessons from experts in their domains. According to the paper titled, Do Self-Help Books Help? by Ed Bergsma, self-help books show options for thinking and acting from the psychological toolkit of the individual that are underdeveloped or could be used more often. This is how I want you to think about this book. I present you with some alternative ways of thinking to help you deal with failure and achieve success. You choose what you want to use in your life based on what you think is best for you. You are your own therapist, and you're fully responsible for your own success. It's important you have the right expectations about what this book can and cannot do for you. While you'll learn numerous techniques to handle failure, you'll never completely eradicate struggles from your life. It's an inherent condition of our lives as human beings, and it's good, because failure can give you as much if not more than success. This book is one of the gifts that failure gave me, if it weren't for the countless mistakes, obstacles and setbacks, I'd have never learned how to develop mental toughness. While I don't believe that you should continuously and deliberately seek failure, it's a fact of life that you'll always encounter it along the way. Don't you think you might as well befriend it, rather than consider it a mortal enemy? If you agree, let's proceed to the first chapter and talk about the true nature of failure in more detail. Chapter 1. What is your definition of failure? According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, failure means a lack of success. The logical assumption that follows is that you're only successful when you reach your end goal. In other words, the process doesn't matter. It's spelled out in black or white terms, it's either success or it's failure. This disempowering definition is one of the primary reasons why people fear and despise failure. You could argue that it's all just semantics, but language shapes your behavior, so it's important to use the right, empowering words. You might consider the following few paragraphs a bit esoteric, but please bear with me and you'll probably start seeing failure in a new light. If you face a difficult problem and you tell yourself, I don't know how to deal with it, you'll think of reasons why you can't do it and not potential solutions. Your brain acts on your instructions, and it's the words you use that steer your thinking process. How likely are you to solve the problem if you're wasting energy coming up with excuses? If instead you tell yourself, okay, let's find a way to figure it out, you'll think of potential solutions and probably solve the problem. Same problem, different words, different outcome. Let's illustrate this with a quick example. John and Kate want to start a business. Both come from the same background and have the same exact resources at their disposal. Is treating the symptoms. You aren't changing as a person. Your habits stay the same and will drag you back to where you started. When you eliminate the root cause a lack of positive habits, inaction, procrastination, or a lack of self-discipline you'll be forever changed and your world will transform according to your internal changes. 
Each time you get angry at how difficult accomplishing your goal is, remind yourself that it's a tool through which you'll gain the right for your success. If all were given to you when you asked, you wouldn't appreciate it and wouldn't become a person who knows how to handle such a reward. In the end, you would probably squander it. Let the filter work its magic and shape you like a blacksmith forges a sword. What is your definition of failure? Quick recap. 1. If you want to handle failure in a constructive way, change your definition of it. If you have a disempowering definition of failure, such as failure is a lack of success, you'll avoid it as much as you can, and thus never achieve the ultimate objective you're after personal growth. Words have power, and changing the definitions you use will change your behavior. 2. A more useful definition of failure is that you fail when you fail to learn something from an event. If you consistently step outside your comfort zone and try new things, you'll always learn something new, and that will empower you and help you achieve your long-term goals. 3. It's you who controls how much of an impact a failure will have on your performance and future progress. Resist the temptation to feel angry, frustrated, discouraged, or guilty when you fail. Instead, make a list of lessons you've learned from not reaching your desired outcome. If you repeatedly make a big deal of every tiny slip-up, you'll fine-tune your brain to react in this way for every future problem. It's a troubling behavior because humans perform best in a positive state, not when dwelling on past mistakes, criticizing oneself, or feeling guilty. For you can use metaphors to further change your beliefs about failure. Three powerful metaphors about failure you can use are, thinking of failure in terms of navigating a maze, in which each failure helps you get closer to the end, looking at failure as a sculpting tool, and considering failure a filter. Cover from it more quickly. Is a failure sometimes indeed unpreventable, or is there something you can always do to reduce the risk of it happening? That's what we'll talk about in this chapter and here's where Stoicism comes into play. This ancient Greek school of philosophy proposes several fundamental principles to live by. While they all can be useful and valuable to a modern person, the tenets we're most interested in for the purpose of this chapter are the following. 1. Accept what can't be changed. Arian, a 2nd century disciple of the prominent Greek Stoic Epictetus opens his Enchiridion of Epictetus, a Stoic manual based on the teachings of Epictetus, with the following words, some things are in our control and others not. Whenever you find yourself angry at a situation you can't change, remind yourself that it's not up to you. I know that it sounds oversimplistic, but as counterintuitive as it is, accepting that things are beyond your control will give you a sense of peace and enable you to move on. After all, there's nothing else you can do, so why not accept that the matter is settled and move on? You dress according to the weather and not according to what you'd like the weather to be like. Staying angry when you can't influence a situation is not only unproductive, it's also like giving yourself an unnecessary punishment. Stoicism is based on the concept that peace of mind comes from focusing on what you can control instead of wasting your energy on things you can't change. According to the Stoics, the only things you can always control are your own thoughts and subsequent beliefs, attitudes, and actions. Everything else whatever is not your own thought, belief or action is outside of your total control, so getting annoyed when something doesn't go your way is a waste of resources. This doesn't mean that Stoics exhibited learned helplessness because they couldn't fully control the world around them. Stoicism has never been about fatalism. Accepting that certain things are beyond your control doesn't mean that you should stop any efforts to improve yourself. Rather, it's about not dwelling on things not going your way, which in turn frees up mental energy to focus on the things that you do control. A great habit to cultivate to become better at accepting that you can't change certain things is to deliberately introduce uncomfortable changes in your life. By stepping outside your comfort zone, you'll learn how to adapt to unfamiliar situations, and this skill will then help you react with more resilience to an unplanned negative situation over which you can't exert control. For example, I've already slept in a car on a couple of occasions. If I'm forced to live out of my car, sleeping in it won't be outside my comfort zone. 
When facing a situation that you can't change, another way to process negative feelings is to acknowledge your emotions. Try to find the root reason why you're feeling them. Ask yourself what they're trying to tell you and how you can accomplish your original goal in the new situation. Resisting your negative emotions, or worse, venting at everything and everyone is a surefire way to suffer more than necessary. As the old adage goes, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. 2. Practice misfortune. Stoics suggested practicing misfortune and visualizing negative things happening in your life. By imagining yourself in or actually putting yourself in a situation that mimics a possible negative event, you can practice your reaction to it, and that can help you build the mental resilience to handle such circumstances in the future. It gives you tremendous control over your life because whatever it throws at you, you'll already have a plan B to bounce back. Note that while you often can't control what happens, you can always control your emotions. Practicing misfortune helps you get better at handling your emotional reactions. This can be as simple as taking a cold shower or camping out in the wilderness. Going without modern luxuries is difficult at first, but you quickly get used to the new circumstances. In the future, whenever you won't have access to hot running water, a comfortable bed, or even a roof over your head, you'll quickly readapt. After all, you've already experienced it, and have probably developed alternative ways to take care of your hygiene or ensure a good night's sleep. Exercise number two, imagine the worst case scenario. Imagining the worst case scenario each time you're faced with difficulties isn't exactly a pleasant strategy. However, if done occasionally, it can be a powerful exercise to gain better control over your emotions. The goal is to visualize the worst thing happening, but instead of doing it out of fear or pessimism, you're doing it to plan for the future or as a reminder that what you have today might disappear tomorrow. Thinking about losing your job and imagining how bad it would be allows you to prepare for the unexpected while you're still in a secure position. What specifically would you do if you had lost your job? How much time would you have to find a new source of income if they fired you today? What actions could you immediately take to bounce back as quickly as possible? Again you aren't doing it to feel pessimistic or out of an assumption that all the good things in your life will disappear overnight. You're doing it as an exercise in acceptance and as a reminder that it might potentially happen. Stoics like to say that you never lose things you return them. Stoics believe that you're only a temporary custodian of all the blessings you have in your life including property, relationships, money, etc. You may get to be a temporary custodian for the rest of your life, or you may lose them sooner. Acceptance of either outcome will help you feel happier and make you more resilient. In addition to coming up with constructive ways of dealing with the problem, ask yourself if your worst case scenario is really so bad. If you're reading this book, you're already in a privileged position. Millions of people all over the world can't afford to buy even a single book. Even if you lost your job today and you had no savings, you could always get help somewhere. You could ask your friends or family for help. You could go eat at a soup kitchen. You could take a dead-end job just to support yourself financially while looking for better opportunities. John says, if only I had money, I could start a business. His disempowering vocabulary if only fine-tunes his brain to come up with further excuses why he can't start a business. Instead of telling herself if only, Kate says, I don't have money, and this means I need to figure out how to bootstrap my business. Her brain receives high-quality instructions, and she comes up with several ideas to start a business on a shoestring. Same problem, different words, different outcome. It's not an unproven theory, discovered by some Martin Meadows guy. The concept that language has a big impact on our life is one of the staples of performance coach Tony Robbins' effective coaching process and has been proven to work with hundreds of thousands of people all over the world. The basic premise of this concept is also the foundation of nonviolent communication, a communication process developed by Marshall Rosenberg, in which replacing one word with another can make the difference between an unproductive fight and successful communication. Scientific research also suggests that words are powerful enough to induce a behavioral change. 
In one study, calling it carrot and x-ray vision carrot increased consumption of this vegetable by 16% among elementary school students. And this effect isn't limited to gullible children alone adults offered the choice in a cafeteria will rate the taste of traditional Cajun red beans with rice more favorably than the taste of red beans with rice or compliment grandma's zucchini cookies more than those described simply as zucchini cookies, even though they're eating the exact same dish. As powerful as our brains are, words can fool them, and you can use this phenomenon to your benefit. I hope that by now you're convinced that words matter on a deeper level than you think. Let's change your definition of failure to something more useful. The American Heritage Dictionary of the English Language defines failure as the condition or fact of not achieving the desired end or ends. If we play with this definition a little, we can develop a more empowering way to think about failure. This definition talks about the desired end. If, instead of making your desired end solely about the final success, but instead define it as learning, you'll never again fail in the traditional sense. You'll also start considering failure your friend, and not a reason to give up. If you focus on the learning experience, you'll realize how flawed the common definitions of failure and success are. You build success through trial and error. It's the failure and the lessons it provides that turn you into a winner, not avoiding it. Sticking to what's known, easy and comfortable, is a surefire way to not reach your goals. When a shy man chats up a woman and she rejects him, did he fail or succeed? To an average person watching the interaction, the man has been rejected. He failed. But did he really? If his intention is to overcome shyness, or in other words, to learn something the outcome of his approach doesn't matter. His desired end is to learn how to become more confident. He was brave enough to step outside his comfort zone and talk. Viewed in terms of his purpose, a rejection might have been an even better outcome than getting a woman's phone number, because repeatedly getting rejected helps him get used to it. In rock climbing my favorite sport you learn more on a difficult route you can't finish than on an easy route that you climb effortlessly. It helps you pinpoint weaknesses you need to address and uncovers your true character. Dealing with difficulties and the fear of a potential fall also sharpens your mental game and helps you become a better climber overall. If your desired end is learning, is taking a fall a failure or success? Is it really better to climb an easy route and succeed, with no learning process, or fall off a difficult one, but learn something new and become a better climber? In martial arts, for training purposes, losing can be more valuable than winning. When you lose against a more able partner, you discover your technical shortcomings. When you crush a weak rival, there's little to no learning. Is getting beaten a failure if you learn something new you otherwise wouldn't have learned? As Josh Waitzkin notes in his book The Art of Learning, an inner journey to optimal performance, great ones are willing to get burn time and again as they sharpen their swords in the fire. Beating weak opponents, crushing easy problems, or doing things well within your comfort zone might make you look good in the eyes of other people, but it's challenging yourself that leads to improvement and long-lasting success. Challenging yourself and persevering in spite of difficulties isn't easy by any means, and we'll spend more time with this topic in a later chapter. For now, make a mental note that failure and success are two sides of the same coin, and one cannot exist without the other. Empowering Story Number 1, Toria Pitt Toria Pitt was as successful as a 24-year-old person could be. She didn't lack in anything, she was in a happy relationship, worked as a mining engineer for one of the world's largest metals and mining corporations, and in addition to her intelligence, she was also one of the Miss Earth Australia contestants. In September 2011, she was invited to participate in a local ultramarathon through Western Australia's Kimberley region. Originally, she didn't plan to participate because of the expensive entry fee, but when the organizers waived it to have some locals participating in the race, she instantly agreed. Toria had been running for 19 kilometers, 12 miles, when she entered a gorge that forever changed her life. Due to an oversight on the part of the race organizers, she found herself in the middle of a bushfire, facing a wall of flames with no escape route. She suffered burns to 65% of her body, lost fingers from her left hand and her thumb from the right hand. A surgeon later commented that she'd been literally cooked down to the bone. Multiple surgeries later, 
she still undergoes on average three surgeries a year, and needs many more to remove the fire scars. Fortunately, despite the horrific event and ongoing painful recovery, her spirit hasn't been broken. In 2014, she trekked a part of the Great Wall of China and raised close to $200,000 for an organization that provides free reconstructive surgery to poorer parts of the world. She continued her career in mining, received a master's degree in mining engineering, studied for an MBA, and became a sought-out motivational speaker. In 2015, she got engaged to her long-term partner, who had supported her throughout the years. In May 2016, she completed her first Ironman Australia competition, and just five months later completed the Ironman World Championship at Kailuakona, Hawaii. As she said before departing for her trek on the Great Wall of China, the fire has turned my life upside down, I don't want it to have any more impact. It was a couple of seconds. What's that compared to a lifetime? When asked in an interview if she ever has bad days, she replied, of course. I go through dark times. But everyone has bad days. You can let. Experiences destroy you or mold you. I choose to let them mold me. Learn from the failure or suffer the consequences. American happiness researcher Sean Aker points out in his book. The Happiness Advantage, The Seven Principles of Positive Psychology. That fuels success and performance at work, that we become more successful when we are happier and more positive. He provides an example of doctors who, when put in a positive mood, before making a diagnosis, show almost three times more intelligence and creativity than doctors who are in a neutral state. In addition to that, they make accurate diagnoses 19% faster. Aker also writes that optimistic salespeople outsell the pessimistic ones by 56% and students primed to feel happy before taking math tests far outperform their neutral peers. Exhibiting positivity is also one of the keys to handle failure in a constructive way and not allow it to destroy your prior achievements. Put online. You can use this strategy to finish a long overdue project, write your first short book, publish an important blog post or article, memorize keywords and phrases in a foreign language, or complete virtually every other goal you can work on in a hotel room. If you're working on other goals like lowering your highly elevated cholesterol levels, spend the entire weekend or week paying extremely close attention to your diet by noting down every single piece of food you put in your mouth. Read a couple of books about the dangers of elevated cholesterol levels. Religiously stick to the recommended workout schedule. The point is to become as immersed in your goal as possible. Even if you can't maintain a given routine in the long term, you'll still benefit from this short-term exercise to remind you of the power that lies inside you if you double down on what's most important to you. Dealing with a failure due to a lack of focus, quick recap. 1. The third common type of failure is caused by a lack of focus. Whenever you spread your attention over too many different goals, you'll hinder your performance. This will likely lead to rapid failure, because it's impossible to reach key goals without sacrificing less significant objectives. 2. To avoid this type of failure, make sure to prioritize big goals and dedicate most of your energy to them. Realize that you can't have your cake and eat it too. Limiting your focus is necessary for success. 3. Embrace boredom and stick to the things that are working well for you, even if they're no longer as exciting as they were in the beginning. 4. Lastly, focus on the essence of the goal you want to reach. Oftentimes you can pinpoint just one key action that will make every other action easier or unnecessary. Do Chapter 5, Dealing with a Fear-Driven Failure Failure driven by fear is one of the most common reasons why people fail to act on their goals or give up prematurely. There are a few different causes of fear, so let's discuss them one by one. 1. Fear of the Unknown As strange as it sounds, people unconsciously often want to fail. They subconsciously live by the motto that a known devil is better than an unknown angel. 
It's easier to let the things stay as they are even if you're not entirely happy with them than to be bold and venture out, seeking greener pastures. A good example of failing due to the fear of the unknown is sticking to your current day job even when you absolutely hate it. Obviously, it isn't sensible to quit without a solid plan the failure lies in the fact that even though you hate your job, you do nothing to change it because you're afraid of the unknown. If you set for yourself a life-changing goal, this means that you need to leave your safe bubble and travel to unknown, potentially dangerous places. It's scary, so it's no wonder that many people sabotage their efforts to avoid this fear. The only solution to overcome this behavior is to slowly, but consistently, stretch your comfort zone and resist the temptation to default to security. While the need for safety is a basic human need we all share, too much of it doesn't go hand in hand with growth. If you want to take your life to the next level, you'll have to sacrifice some of that security for growth. The first time I climbed a 100 feet high cliff, 30 meters, I was extremely scared. When I stood exposed on the rock face, with the wind blowing at me strongly and surrounded by open space in all directions, I felt the temptation to ask my belayer to lower me. It would be nice to touch the ground again and feel safe, but I wouldn't have learned anything that way. I pushed ahead, overcame my fear and completed the route. After so many scary experiences, I still feel queasy or even get panicky at times. If you keep challenging yourself, those feelings will never leave you.